Welcome to Locked On's 2023 NBA Mock Draft Special, the most comprehensive mock draft with local and national experts providing insight and analysis you can't get anywhere else. Don't miss a single pick as we discuss where the future stars of the NBA will call home. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everyone? Welcome into the final episode of our 2023 Locked On NBA Mock Draft Special. The most comprehensive mock draft you'll find. It's gotten even bigger this year, and it's been a blast so far. This six-episode series will take you through the entire first round of the NBA draft with insight you won't find anywhere else from all of the drafting teams, thanks to the local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Throughout this special, you've been hearing from and you will hear from this final episode hopefully you've listened to episodes one through five we've got our local nba shows many of our college shows that cover your favorite teams every monday through friday our nba draft experts from the locked on nba big board podcast and this year we've had some great insight from our locked on nba insider howard beck thanks for being with us and i'm happy to be here hosting this year i'm kylan mills basketball host and analyst for the pac-12 network nbc sports bay area as well as the co-host of the locked on warriors podcast here on the show i am joined now by the great co-host and analyst first nba draft analyst and host of the locked on nba big board podcast rafael barlow and college basketball expert and the solo host i'm just going to keep going with that now we've got to get andy back a little bit right That's the solo right. host of the locked on college basketball podcast isaac shade i think we're literally just like making up some drama and tension going on thank there. you I mean, that's what i need in my life right now is, is just more dr- no i'm just kidding <laughs> andy and i'll have fun with it on our show too let's make it happen Perfect. All right, great. We'll be listening to that. All right, well, the 26th pick is coming up next. Indiana Pacers supposed to be on the clock, but we have learned there is a trade that has gone down. Here's what it is. The Pacers get Royce O'Neal, and the Nets get this 26th pick in the 2023 draft. Now, before we get to any of our thoughts, let's check in with Locked On NBA insider Howard Beck with his reaction to this trade. I think there's a lot to like about this trade on both sides. Indiana Pacers, obviously a young team that is now trying to build around Tyrese Halliburton, Matherin, Nemhard, this young core that they've been putting together. And Royce O'Neal is a guy who's going to be 30 next season, a veteran presence, a selfless player, good shooter uh, and defender, who's just a, a good glue guy. So he's the right kind of play, I think, for this Pacers team at this time. And for the Nets, look, they've got a surplus of veteran three and D guys, and they need to start kind of uh, reshuffling the deck a little bit and adding first round picks uh, in exchange for some of their vets makes a lot of sense as they try to find their new direction. And Sean Marks and his staff have been great in finding uh, great value late in the draft. So I think a, a really nice move for both teams. Okay, the Nets have been wheeling and dealing in this draft here in the later rounds or the later picks of the first (laughs) round. Uh, We've got two of our three next picks are going to the Nets now. What do you think they've got up their sleeve, our guy Adam, Raphael? Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, they had picks, I think, 20 and 21, and now they're going to end up with, is it three or four first-round picks total? (laughs) Three. I don't think they had... Did they have one Three. before 22? No. Yeah. yeah, they just said it's 22. Repair was their first choice, I think. Yes, now they have 26 and 28. So it's just three, but in like a short time span here at the bottom yep. of the draft. All right, what, what? based on that, what do you think they're going after? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's like they went into the draft with a bunch of wings and they added a wing in Repair. Mm-hmm. They still have not addressed their, their need for front court depth. So that's the direction I would go in. Mm-hmm. But they have the picks. And I think with this draft, I feel like it was fluid between maybe 15 through 25, or maybe you can say 15 through 30. So they could still end up getting the players that they really wanted in the same draft range, and you get three of them instead of two. Isaac, what's what's the face for it? For well, those I'm listening, tra- Isaac's making some kind of pensive face. I was I was trying to think based on what Raphael just said, and knowing that they're right here at twenty six and again at twenty eight, I was thinking like with that front court need, could they could either take Jackson Davis here, Trace Jackson Davis from Indiana, or if they think he won't go at twenty seven to the Hornets, they could wait. Uh, till 28 and maybe they've got somewhere else they want to go maybe some 
backcourt, uh, you know, maybe some more playmaking or something of that need, or maybe they go after two front court guys here. Uh, maybe even somebody that could play some small ball for or something of that nature. So curious to see what happens. If they do go after front court guys, who's the best available uh, in that positional need? Trace Jackson Davis. That's who I'd want. Raphael, you co-signing that? Yeah, I'm co-signing it all the way. I don't even know if there's anybody I would say is even close to, to Trace Jackson Davis that I think could, could come in that I will spend a first round pick on. Yep. So I'm going with TJD here also. All right. Well, the pick is in. Let's check in with Locked On Nets host Adam Armbrecht to find out his selection. The Brooklyn Nets continue to shed salary in the NBA draft, this time moving up the board and making a deal with the Indiana Pacers, sending Royce O'Neal to Indiana in exchange for the 25th overall pick, at which point they selected guard Colby Jones out of Xavier. Now at six foot six, he represents some versatility in the backcourt with the ability to play either of the guard positions, certainly represents all of the characteristics that the Nets seem to want after trading away their superstars. He's a high character player. He does the little dirty things on the defensive end and he'll have to continue to develop some of his consistency and avoid making some of those young mistakes on that end of the floor offensively he does a solid job using his frame and his size to overcome a lack of initial first step still being able to get at the basket and show off a very smooth and consistent shot in the mid-range game he does however need to work on some of his perimeter mechanics if he wants to become an effective three-point shooter as he does bring the ball in low before hoisting up on his shots if he can do so though he represents a player that could be multifunctional for the Brooklyn Nets offense, doing some ball handling, showing off some of that facilitation where he continued to increase his assists year over year at the college level, while also being a strong rebounder, bringing down seven boards per game this past year. All right, there we have it. The 26th pick is shooting guard Colby Jones out of Xavier. Great positional size at six foot six, can play either guard or slide over to a wing. What do you like about this fit? Raphael in terms of the net specifically well Kobe's just solid he's solid all the way around he impacts games in multiple ways he rebounds he passes he averaged 5.7 rebounds 4.4 assists per game he gets you a steal he even shot the ball at a high clip this year like the biggest concern coming into the season was his outside shooting doesn't yeah. take him at a, a big volume but he shot a little under 38 percent from three if he can continue to progress as a shooter He's just a guy that's not going to wow you with crazy upside and athleticism, but he's just solid all the way around. And I think he could be one of the late first round picks that can come in and contribute and help a team right away. I, I give this, this, this pick a, 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 okay. What would you grade this pick Isaac? Hmm. Yeah. I, I'll go a minus only because of the growing uh, three point shooting that I still want to see from Colby uh, would have, you know, as someone who can kind of play that two or three is where I'd expect to see him more, more in the shooting guard position, which is like a little bit more shooting from that. But I love the pick. I love him as a young man. I actually um, randomly was texting with the gentleman. That's the the coach at his high school earlier today, before we were recording this. And he's like, man, I'm just, was I was telling him we were, doing this and he's like i'm so excited to see where colby goes i can't wait and just the effusiveness with which he talked about this young man it, it clearly just somebody that just uh, goes well with anyone he interacts with whether that's coaches teammates whatever and you see it played out like in his numbers last year had 15 points and you love that ability to put it in the basket whether mid-range or at the hoop or uh on those three pointers uh, again as Raphael said not many attempts per game i think he had like 3.3 attempts per game but also has 5.7 rebounds. You love to see that out of a kind of guard position along with 4.4 assists. And so he's doing a lot of these things that just make him better. And that's what I want to see. You mentioned the assist numbers. I'm curious. He has played some point, you know, is that you mentioned to you think he could play a two or three where, where is this facilitating at? Could he back up at that position at all? Or do you think really uh, at the next level, it's a two or three strictly? He, he is able to handle like in PNR in pick and roll game. Like he's able to do some of that well and hold on to it. Um, I, I think I would want to see him more as the secondary rather than the primary ball handler, but I think he could do it if pushed into duty. Um, 
but the, the other thing too is that um, his active hands, he's, he's got good active hands, is a plus defender. And so even if not a primary ball handler a lot of the time, could be a primary ball handler garter. If that makes sense. <laughs> I, I get what you're saying. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, no, I get it. Raphael, are you uh, in agreement with Isaac on that? Yeah, and at his size, at 6'6", six, six, he has the, the size and the ability to basically complement a guy like Cam Thomas, a guy that is kind of like a point guard size but does not pass the ball ever. When <laughs> Cam Thomas gets it, you know it's going up. But you can run a lineup where you have Cam and Kobe, where Kobe is the the ball handler and the decision maker and it allows Cam to do what he does best, which is score while still defending the point guard. And so a guy like Kobe Jones with the size and the rebounding and the passing, I think he is like this guy that fits in that can make everyone around him, everyone's job better. And then his size at 6'6", like I said, if you look at the playoffs, the importance of size and, and, and strength. It, I mean, you just saw how valuable two-way guys are. And so I think for a team like the Nets, who have playoff aspirations next year, I think he can come in and help them in the playoffs. Okay. Mm-hmm. that's uh, Those are some strong words there. Well, for more on Joe's skill set. You don't think they're going to the playoffs, Isaac? I mean, that, that no, looks no, 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 no. The, yeah, 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 yeah. There was no, some, there was some was, noises being made by Isaac. I'm not sure what turn, they were. You got some wheels turning in my head there. We've talked a lot about twins on our mock draft. There was a twin who kind of got, I think, earned himself some money recently for the heat in the playoffs that uh-huh. I think I think Colby Jones has a little bit of resemblance to his game as kind of a little bit of a do-it-all perimeter guy. Are you tracking with me, Barlow, on that? I get no? it. I, I get it. I, I get where you're going here. Yeah, so I was just processing what you were saying, and and I kind of liked it uh, with with that uh, connection to Mr. Martin there, um, who, honestly, I got to see a lot when he was at NC State before going to Nevada. And so um, I, I like that talk, what, what you're going there of like, man, the, the perimeter, do-it-all perimeter guy uh, is very valuable, and yeah. Colby is that kind of guy. I kind of liked it. I want that just like, I don't know, in a gif or a gif or however you say that. I kind of liked like, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the way you said that, you got a little pizzazz there. All right, well, let's see if Andy Patton of Locked on College Basketball kind of liked it too. <laughs> Xavier guard Colby Jones was great as a sophomore, but he exploded onto the scene under Sean Miller as a junior, averaging 15 points, five and a half boards, and four and a half assists per game last year for the Musketeers. I'm Andy Patton, the host of the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. And Jones is the kind of versatile do-it-all guard that you absolutely love in the modern NBA, especially after seeing his three-point percentage go from a paltry 29.2 as a sophomore to 37.8% last year with Xavier. This is a guy who can play off the ball. He can play on the ball. He's got a lot of length and athleticism on the defensive side of the floor. And if that outside shooting remains, he's got the perfect set of skills to be a very, very solid role player in the modern NBA. What do you guys think? Agree? Uh, solid, you might, solid skills? You might to call be a role him player, a solid role player in the NBA? <laughs> an X factor coming from X. I love it. Because he's coming from Xavier. And I, I just always call Xavier X so that I don't have to say the whole school name. So I'm going to call Colby my X factor from X from now on all right x factor from x let's see if richard statement of the locked on nba big board would also call kobe jones the x factor from x (laughs) the brooklyn nets adding a third first round pick was big i really like kobe jones as well as i liked ryan repair i think that kobe jones you know while he is kind of a jack of all trades master of none he really needs to work on both his explosiveness at the rim countering some of that uh, that you know that you may not be able to develop, but at least how are you going to counter that? And then also his jump shot consistency. His year-over-year shooting consistency hasn't ever been strong. There are some indicators he has a really good floater, which generally that can be seen as shooting touch upside, but he's able to always find a way to put his fingerprints all over the game. He always has an impact in the game. Almost every game it felt like he was getting either a steal or block, maybe even both in a good portion of games. He was getting assists. He was getting rebounds. He was playing defense. There's always a way for Colby Jones to find the way on the floor. And in the NBA, you always have to have a reason to be on the floor. Colby's always going to have some of that. I think he's an ideal role player out in Brooklyn. 
Okay, up next, our 27th pick already upon us. The Charlotte Hornets on the clock once again. Now, they brought in that coveted pick that is guard Scoot Henderson at the with the number two overall pick in our mock draft. Now, lower down the board, you guys mentioned it may be, you know, some tougher situations for young players to come into, but this is a team that, you know, some of these young guys could immediately make an impact. Who do you see being a fit with Charlotte? Oh, I, I still may go with TJD. I think that he could provide an insurance just in case P.J. Washington leaves in free agency. He's another passer, a rebounder, a shot blocker. They could also go with a guy like Dreek Whitehead. He wouldn't have to go too far from Durham to Charlotte. Mm -hmm. If you get him, again, you're getting a guy. We talked about it out there. A guy that was a particular top pick that did some injuries. That could be an option there. But what's interesting about Charlotte is that if you look at the guys available, and then you look at their current roster as the way it's constructed, you still could have a hard time finding guaranteed minutes if James Booknight or JT Thor. I mean, they've had quite a few picks. Bryce McGowan's who they're high on. They converted him from a two-way to a standard contract. So it's almost like even though the team isn't good, you're not guaranteed to, <laughs> to come in and get a top seven or eight rotation spot at this pick. I like those a lot. One of the things, the conversation we had earlier with the Hornets was essentially – is it Scoot or is it Brandon Miller? They didn't get Brandon Miller, obviously, so they might be still looking for some of that shooting. So in that regard, I love the Dariq Whitehead call there from Raphael. Another guy or another two guys from the same school I might look at is we've talked, we've mentioned Amari Bailey from UCLA's name before. I like him. Another that I don't think we've talked about yet on this show is Jaime Hawkes, who just has mm -hmm. been the dude for UCLA recently, stepped in after Johnny Juzang left and really helped Mick Cronin's team take off there. And so uh, just somebody who's done it and that I think could continue to do it in Charlotte. Uh, Jaime Hawkes would be somebody I'd look at as well. All right, well, the pick is in. Let's go to our Locked On Hornets host, Walker Mel, with his selection. I'm Walker Mail from the Locked On Hornets podcast. Back after selecting Scoot Henderson, number two overall. Here they are at 27. They acquired this pick in a trade involving Jalen Durant last year. They got this from the Denver Nuggets. And so, with the 27th overall pick in the Locked On NBA mock draft, the Charlotte Hornets select Dariq Whitehead, the local kid, the freshman, out of Duke. Now, this is a pure talent gamble. Someone that had high expectations coming into his loan season with the Blue Devils. Unfortunately, it was mired in injury. Now, he did come back from an injury. He suffered against Virginia Tech. He played on Feb February 11th and then all the way through the rest of the season had some really awesome numbers, at least efficiency wise, shot close to 50 percent from the field, shot over 50 percent from three on the season in its entirety. He shot about 43 percent from three point range. So we'll see if the shooting can continue in the NBA. I think he's got some connector ability too, and the next level. So we'll see a pure talent gamble. Hopefully it pans out for the Hornets and Derek Whitehead as he makes this transition. Again, Walker Mail, catch me on Twitter at Walker Mail, my co host on Twitter at Doug Branson LOH. And you can check out Locked On Hornets anywhere you get your podcast. All right. What do you guys think? Uh, good pick. You both mentioned him before the pick, but now the pick's been made. What do you see his role being with Charlotte? Well, first of all, if you would have said back in August that the Charlotte Hornets would get Derek Whitehead and Scoot Henderson, or Scoot Henderson and Derek Whitehead in the draft, you would have thought that they had two lottery picks. So, I mean, it's a, it's not necessarily a gamble because, I mean, they're, they're getting a guy that shot 40% from three. Even if he doesn't return to his high school form, he is a, another floor spacer that complements. So I like the pick. Charlotte needs shooting. I mean, every team needs shooting. But now I think that they could possibly move Cherry Rogier. You could probably get some assets for, for Rogier. So I like the move there. Man, yeah, I mean, as with, you know, earlier, we talked about Derek Lively, his teammate at Duke, whose freshman year was really hampered by injury. We talked about Nick Smith Jr. from Arkansas, whose freshman year was really hampered by injury. Both of those were projected lottery guys coming into the year, just like Derek Whitehead, as Raphael just said. And so for me, like coming into the season, he was the number two player in college basketball right behind Nick Smith in terms of NBA projectability. And so like, if he is good to go, because like, not only did he have that preseason um, surgery ahead of last year, he just had yeah. another one on his foot in early May. Now, everything I've read and heard and seen is that he's going to be ready to go for the season. And so like, 
my fingers are crossed because we always want to cheer for these young men, right? Like we want to see the best. We want things to work out. And so I'm really hopeful that everything's going to be good with him. Um, I legitimately think he, he j- just wasn't right all year at Duke. Obviously, I mean, he's having this other surgery, right, that he just had in early May. And so I don't think we saw his usual explosiveness or athleticism at Duke. And so if for folks who want to get a real read on Derek Whitehead, just – Like, sure, check out his Duke highlights, but go watch the high school version of Dariq Whitehead to get a better sense of who this young man actually is. And all that said, to be to know that he's coming off of surgery and to still do all that that Walker talked about, that Raphael talked about with his shooting. Man, I'm encouraged by that. And to get him at 27 could could be the steal of the draft. But interestingly, I don't think we'll know that for a while. Yeah. One thing that has always come up with Derek Whitehead, no matter who you talk to, anyone that knows him, they always rave about his character and how great of a person he is and how he is just someone that can make your team better. Just, I mean, whether he's playing or not, just because he he brings such a a, a good character. And I think Charlotte needs a guy like that in their locker room. May not be like the veteran high character guy because he's still young and, and he's around the same age as a lot of guys on that team. But Charlotte has had, has had some, some bad PR recently, and Derek Whitehead is someone that Great will point. not bring them any negative PR. For more on Duke wing Derek Whitehead, here's J.J. Jackson of Locked on Blue Devils. Derek Whitehead has the opportunity to be an excellent shooter in the NBA as he missed some time due to injury in his lone season at Duke. But as he gained his rhythm, it became clear why he was a top five prospect out of high school. His length at six foot seven makes him intriguing as someone who can play and defend multiple positions. Whitehead actually shot a slightly higher percentage from three than two in his lone season for the Blue Devils, a 43 percent three-point shooter from beyond the arc this season, giving him value as a shooter, but also giving him something that he can work on at the next level, putting the ball on the floor and getting to the rim. Okay, for more on how Whitehead could translate to the NBA, here's Leif Tulin of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. At 27, the Charlotte Hornets select Dariq Whitehead from Duke, not having to travel far from Durham, North Carolina to Charlotte. Dariq Whitehead came into the season as one of the top five recruits by all uh, recruiting websites and their rankings struggled with injury, but he came alive late in the Duke season as their, as their team played their best basketball shooting 43% from three. You don't typically associate a guy with a illustrious high school career like Dariq's and shooting being his main asset. He was someone who played on the ball at Montverde Academy, which I don't think should be discounted. And then you add in adapting to a talented team shooting 43%. I think if he were to be available at 27, that's a tremendous pick by the Charlotte Hornets, a team that could use shooting to complement whoever they're able to add to it, the team that's going to feature LaMelo ball and now scoot Henderson. So what do you need shooting Derek Whitehead can pull that in, in droves. And also he's someone that with the ball is better than you give credit for. He just fit a team that had two guards and Tyrese Proctor and Jeremy Roach already handling those duties. He's young. He comes in from Montford with one of the most electric, illustrious high school uh, accolades. He played alongside Cade Cunningham, Caleb Houston. All these guys are professionals now and played from a young age onward, eventually became the man and led Montverde to another unbelievable season as the best player on that team. And that those teams had players that have already been selected in this draft class. I think Dariq Whitehead's going to outplay that pick at number 27. Good pick from the Charlotte Hornets. Three more selections remaining here in our Locked On NBA Mock Draft Special. Who is the next to go off the board? What exactly are the Nets looking for? Is they're up right again, as well as the Pacers will make a selection. We'll find all of that out. Our final three picks are up next here on our Locked On NBA Mock Draft Special. This Locked On NBA Mock Draft Special is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits just right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit. 
or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only and exclusions do apply. Just keep that in mind. Continuing our Locked On NBA Mock Draft special, the Brooklyn Nets up once again for the third time in these last 10 selections in the first round of our Mock Draft. They've already chosen Colby Jones out of Xavier, and they also went with Ryan Rupair out of the New Zealand Breakers. What, what else are they looking for at this point? <laughs> we talked about it earlier. We yeah. said at 26, they should I like take Trace Jackson Davis or if they think Charlotte wouldn't get him at 27, maybe like if you're willing to risk it, then you could wait on him at 28. I, I think that's the play. Okay. It, it has to be. I mean, you look at their front line. If I look at their roster, the only, I think, true bigs on their roster are Dayron Sharp and Nick Claxton. You need one more. I mean, you got Dorian Finney listed at Dorian Finney Smith listed as a four. I mean, they still have Ben Simmons, but I think they need a natural big. And I mean, to me, TJD has to be the pick. Has to be the pick. Will the Nets agree? We'll find out because the pick is in. Let's go to Adam Armbrecht of Locked On Nets. Now, the Brooklyn Nets did not come into the draft night thinking they were going to take three selections in the evening. However, they did shed $16 million in salary. And when the board unfolds for you and there aren't any calls, you go ahead and take a prospect that you think fits a need. Enter Trace Jackson Davis out of Indiana. Now, this prospect is six foot nine, 250 pounds. He's physical. And that's something that this team certainly lacks. He identifies as being someone that plugged in successfully to a small ball lineup however looking at that power forward position in the offensive end you can expect jackson davis to be a player that will use that big frame get physical with players inside of the paint and attack at the basket he has a good sense for where defenders are and finishes with aggression around the rim on the defensive end of the floor he does show some nice versatility is able to go ahead and work against the pick and roll scenarios and obviously has that rebounding contribution that you want he is 23 years old which is a red flag for any NBA prospect, especially a first round pick. But when we know the Brooklyn Nets want to get younger and want to bring more physicality, a player like Jackson Davis can certainly fill that need and be a contributor coming off the bench going forward. All right. You guys said that had to be the pick. They made it. How do you feel like the Nets made out in this draft? I think they did a good job. They entered with two picks, ended up with three, saved some money. They addressed their need for uh, a back of big. They addressed their need for, and I wouldn't say it's a need, but they replaced the wing defender that they gave up in repair. And then they got like a jack of all trades and Kobe Jones. So they have to be in the running for the winners of this 2023 locked on NBA mock draft. Oh, okay. We're going to be making those announcements at the very, very end, but interesting nets in the running. Isaac, how would you grade their selection so far? I guess so what far I, in what we've seen, they've made the three. <laughs> they don't have I, any more, right? No, no, no. They're I not hope upset. not. Goodness. Uh, what yeah. I love is that they've brought in multiple high character guys. I, I honestly don't know too much about repair, but obviously we talked about it with Colby Jones. And then Trace Jackson Davis has just been a stud of a teammate, stuck around when Mike Woodson came in to take over a couple years ago, really helped Jalen Huchfino a lot, out a lot this year, as we talked about earlier on our show. And so, yeah, I, I think this is a great get for the Nets. They've added added people at different spots on the court. And yeah, so th they've done well here in this first round. Yeah, right, Rupert well, is definitely a high, sorry to cut you off. Go Rupert ahead. No, is go definitely ahead. A, a high, high character guy. And he is, I mean, I, I think you'd have a hard time finding a more mature 18 year old. I think he's still 18. He's from France. He lived in Australia for a whole season by himself. Mm. Think about that. When you were 18, could you go live in a foreign country all by yourself, and he did not. My parents speak. wouldn't leave me at home alone when I was 18, so. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac. I'm just... and, and what's even more incredible Isaac about. Isaac still had babysitters at 18, so there you go. <laughs> well, I mean, at least 
props to you for being able to share that now. I'm sure it was embarrassing <laughs> back then. <laughs> One of the things about repair that that I really that caught my attention was the fact that he didn't speak a lot of English when he went to mm. Australia. So mm. on top of being young and moving to a different continent, not just country, continent by yourself, he was there without knowing much of the language. And he speaks English now. So it takes a, a, like an extreme level of maturity to be able to handle that. And I mean, and then he's, like I said, he's just a high character guy. And like you said, the Nets got three really high character guys in this class. So big win for the Nets. No, I mean, that's crazy to think about being 18 and living somewhere overseas where you don't speak the language uh, or at least barely do. So, I mean, yeah. definitely speaks to his maturity. I mean, for yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. Well, for more on Indiana forward, Trace Jackson Davis. Here's Richard Stamen of the Locked On NBA Big Board. Yet again, the Brooklyn Nets are on the clock with the with the 28th pick, and they made an absolute steal of a pick yet again. I really like Trace Jackson Davis. He's an ideal modern big off the bench. I think you look at the lack of shooting may worry some teams. I would say in the NBA Combine, in both the shooting drills and his pro day, he did enough to believe, hey, there maybe there is something to work with here with his, with his jump shot. Free throw percentage can often be a good indicator. Shot 69.5% from the free throw line, which actually isn't bad. It's pretty in line with some bigs. And it's better than most non-shooting bigs. So maybe it was something he didn't get to showcase. But you look at guys that can run the pick and roll, uh, uh, excuse me, operate as a roll man in the pick and roll, can defend multiple positions, extremely athletic, great rebounder. That's going to translate able to have the ball in his hands pass a little bit. I think he can be trusted with quick decisions on both ends, and that's absolutely massive. Brooklyn has killed this first round of the draft. All right, sounds Yeah, everyone's co-signing this. Brooklyn Nets are getting an A, and they're going to be up for the maybe best showing in this draft. David Locke's going to have a run for his money uh, and earning those accolades. And we wrap up after we make our last selection. Up now, though, it's the 29th pick going to the Indiana Pacers. Now, the Pacers took forward Jarris Walker with a seventh overall pick. What are they still looking for at this point in the game, Rafael? I would say shooting on the wing. And I mean, it sounds redundant because there are a lot of teams that need that. And the Toronto Raptors yeah. and the Nets have all the, <laughs> have like a, 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 too many wings as is. But yeah, if I were the Pacers, I would look to add shooting and someone on the wing that can come in and, and, and defend multiple positions. You're okay. So Isaac's like kind of furrowing his brow, maybe like a little bit pensive. Do you agree that they should look for a wing? If yeah. they do, who do, who do you got coming off the board next? My, my pensive furrowing is because each time that Raphael <laughs> suggests who it should be, my brain just starts going through the Rolodex of players left. Like it stinks that Derek Whitehead just came off the board because he would have been a great fit there. Um, somebody yeah. that has kind of come up and made a name for himself that would like, I love this dude's toughness. I love his ability to shoot, and that would be Santa Clara's Brandon Pajemski. And so uh, that might be somebody to look for who could definitely add that shooting from the wing. Okay, interesting. Do you have anyone else in mind, Raphael? There's a guy that I really like that I'm surprised that he's off the board, and it's Olivier Maxence Prosper. He had a phenomenal NBA combine, a great pro day. From my knowledge, he is probably the biggest riser since the end of the season to now. Mm -hmm. And I, he's someone that I would definitely look at because he has that size. And I think the Pacers, are, even though they're kind of in this rebuilding mode, I think that they are closer to being a playoff team. And Omax has the length and the athleticism and, and the size and upside as a shooter that I think could be someone that could be a, someone that could help them in, in the playoffs because of his defense. All right, our 29th pick is officially in. Here's Tony East of Locked On Indiana Pacers. Tony East here with Locked On Pacers and with the 29th pick, originally owned by the Celtics, traded the Pacers in the Malcolm Brogdon deal. The Pacers will take Andre Jackson Jr. from UConn for their second first rounder after taking Jarris Walker seventh overall in this exercise. Jackson Jr. already worked out for the Pacers prior to the NBA draft combine. You saw him in the national championship game, led every player in that game with six assists, and that is where he shines, right? He's this 6'6", wingish, guardish kind of player who's so heady. He's always in the right spot, a brilliant cutter, a smart, nosy defender, 
who can pass it almost five assists per game, despite very rarely having the ball, not really a play finisher, but it's defense and passing stand out. The Pacers need some defense. They need a player like this. Who's going to be in the right positions. Who's going to make smart plays. Jackson jr. Kind of a project type, but still definitely something the Pacers could need. And they're happy to get him late in the first round of the locked on mock draft. Okay. Mm. What, what do you guys make? This wasn't necessarily the number one name you were bringing up. What do you make no. of the selection of Andre Jackson, uh, the Yukon guard? Well, if Raphael was right and they need shooting, they did not get it. Uh, <laughs> that uh, is no. not Andre Jackson's game, but I love Andre Jackson as a college basketball player, because if ever there was a glue guy, like he would be the Elmer's like spokesman. Like he is the glueiest of all these kind of dudes. Glue. Elmer Super comes glue. off. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait a second. Exactly. We got to upgrade from Elmer's here. No, I mean, it, it's interesting because he was the sixth leading scorer on this year's national championship team, mm-hmm. 6.7 points per game, but also had 6.2 rebounds, 4.7 assists, just like coming within mere few stats of triple doubles on multiple occasions this season. Um, Andre Jackson is just a guy that does it and, and not in necessarily all the ways where you can just look at a box score and be like, oh, yeah clearly he's obviously a phenomenal basketball player like you can't be lazy to appreciate Andre Jackson you have to go watch him play basketball Uh, although he was the sixth leading scorer he is top three in importance on last year's team the him staying in the draft which was a late decision is a huge blow to UConn for next year but speaks of what he'll add to any franchise I mean just go read the things that head coach Danny Hurley says about him just go read the things that his teammates say about him being the best teammate they've ever played with and you find everything you need to know about Andre Jackson yeah you know when I'm watching the playoffs and I sometimes I, I look at like a team like Denver and I see a guy like um Oh, I can't think of his name right now. Bruce Brown, right? Mm. A guy that comes off the bench, does a little bit of everything, just just weird positionless basketball. Sometimes he's at the four. Sometimes he's initiating the offense. He's knocking down open shots, which I don't see Andre Jackson being able to do right now. But I think Andre Jackson could be that, that weird connective Bruce Brown type guy where you just can put him in multiple lineups You can play him as a small ball four, and he's the type that can grab the rebound and initiate the fast break. He can cut. He's a phenomenal athlete, and he's just a different type of um, passer, right? He can initiate the offense. Like I said, he fights cutters. I like to pick. I am concerned about the shooting, Mm. but with Halliburton, who's already a phenomenal passer, Jairus Walker, who is a phenomenal (laughs) passer for a big, and then Andre Jackson, the Pacers are probably going to be one of the more unselfish teams in the NBA. On the other side of the ball, the Pacers were 26th in defensive rating this last season. You mentioned Jackson's physicality or athleticism. What does he add on that side of the ball? He's going to be helpful for sure. Because again, somebody that can, uh, that has the athleticism to do it all. That is going to like, he could basically you slot him in at the, 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 probably the three, but could guard two to four if need be. Um, and is going to help. He gets team concepts defensively from, for my money's worth. And um, it is somebody that can definitely help grow that metric for the Pacers next year. Um, it, like, And goodness, just once again, I mean, does it all. I love what Raphael's saying there about him. Like, I like to call these grab and go guys like a grab and go lunch, but can take the ball off the rim on one side and is gone on the other can set up all the plays like had multiple assists in 32 of his 36 games last year, had at least one assist in 35 of his 36 games last year. And so uh, that that two way capability that you see there, man, uh, congrats to this team. Well, for more on Jackson, let's check in in now with Isaac's counterpart, Andy Patton of the Locked on College Basketball podcast. Dan Hurley and the Yukon Huskies were always going to have to repeat as national champions without Jordan Hawkins, but now we know they will also be without do-it-all guard Andre Jackson Jr. Jackson is one of those guys that doesn't jump off the screen from a statistical perspective. He only averaged under seven points per game last year, under six, or about six rebounds and about five assists per game. He's not a great three-point shooter, only 28% last year in his junior year with Yukon, but he does just about 
everything. He's a winning player. He makes the kind of plays you need to do. He is an elite passer, especially in transition, and his length and athleticism translate to him being a very, very good defender at the next level. He's the kind of player that may not do a lot statistically that jumps off the screen, but man, can he impact winning basketball games, and he's going to be a very, very good one in the NBA. Andy, thinking the same things you are. You guys are on the same wavelength. And, and he mentioned the transition passing being a huge factor. All right, well, let's check in now with Leaf Tulin of the Locked On NBA Big Board to find out more about how Jackson's skill set might work in the NBA. At 29, the Indiana Pacers select the Energizer Bunny, the heartbeat of a national championship team in Andre Jackson of UConn, someone who makes everyone around him better. No accolades went to him for all the uh, rewards and success that UConn got. Adama Sanogo, Big East Player of the Year, and most outstanding player. Jordan Hawkins, a lottery pick, but neither of them would be where they are without this guy, Andre Jackson runs the floor like a gazelle, can play the point guard on offense, struggles to shoot the ball a little bit, and he's a junior, defends like his hair's on fire, flies around, rebounds, passes, does anything your team wants. At 29, you're getting a guy that you know will put forth his all. Only question mark is how well he can shoot. And he shot a decent percentage, if you count numerically, but there are a lot of them were dare shots. Uh, Andre Jackson, someone who will pass, rebound, defend, try your hardest, be a coach's best friend, that the, a coach will love him. And everyone, and I mean everyone, We'll love Andre Jackson in the city of Indiana, someone that could uh, that appreciates the hustle, the grit and grind that he'll bring to the court. And I watched him in the combine up close, and he made everyone look better and was the most talkative player on the court. The Pacers, at, fans at least, will get a fan favorite, and we'll see if he pans out as a Pacer. And it's largely dependent on his shooting progress because defensively and intensity, he is a great pick. Defends like his hair is on fire. I love it, man. <laughs> so good. I like that description. I like that description. That's great. All right. Well, our final pick in our locked on NBA Mac mock draft lies ahead. In addition to, and that pick, by the way, going to go to the Los Angeles Clippers. It'll be the first time we see them in this draft. Curious to see which direction they will go. Also, the more importantly, we're going to name our biggest winners, our losers, biggest surprises of this mock draft. It's going to really come down to the wire. David Locke has had a great day. However, the Nets also made a splash so far. We'll find out who walked away the biggest winner next. This Locked On NBA Mock Draft Special is brought to you by FanDuel. If you're watching your favorite sporting event, maybe you want to make it a little bit more exciting, throw a little bit of extra skin in the game. FanDuel is the thing you want to do. You can place all kinds of picks and bets on different games, different players. I personally had so much fun playing FanDuel throughout the NBA Finals. My money was on Nikola Jokic and the Denver Nuggets, and I won pretty big. Now, new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action that's America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. It is time for the 30th pick and the final pick in our Locked On NBA mock draft. The Los Angeles Clippers are now on the clock, made quite the splash before the trade deadline during the regular season. Couldn't quite come up with the results in the postseason. It, Raphael, what is the biggest need for the Clippers this offseason? <laughs> Health. <laughs> Health, yes. It's yeah. very much the overarching theme of that team. But what about some versatility and athleticism at the forward position? Um, I mean, I think... If Kawhi and Paul George are healthy, then you, you have that covered. And yeah. if, if they bring Westbrook back, even though he's not the same athlete that he was 10 years ago, he's still a phenomenal athlete. I think the Clippers should look at some athleticism in the front court. And the mm. guy that I would target would be James Naji from Barcelona. Ooh. He is like, I, I've called him the European version, but I don't want to like, leave off his Nigerian roots, but he's Nigerian. He's been based out of Spain. So it's like the Nigerian European version of Jalen Duran. I mean, if you look at this guy's body, he is a man child. 
at only 18 years old. And so I think that he could come in and provide some depth off the bench with his rebounding, energy, shot blocking. Just seems like a guy that should just have an easy role. And he's been playing professional for years. He's been playing as a professional. And then Olivier Maxence, Prosper Omax is someone that could provide depth in the wings with athleticism and shooting and I mean, <laughs> the way the past few years have gone, either Paul George or Kawhi has not been healthy. And so I think that it makes sense to provide, to look for someone that can hmm. not feel what they do, but at least defensively have that same type of length that they'd be missing if one of those guys are, are out. Isaac, what do you think? Uh, you're making some grunting noises this time around. There was as much as it's still a pensive <laughs> face a little bit, but there was like a, mm, mm-hmm, no, mm, this is, this mm, is such amen. a fun, this is such a fun exercise for me. Cause it's like, all right, Raphael's talking about this. Who do I think fits it? Like, it's just fun for me to process. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. as Raphael talks about athletic front court guy, we've mentioned his name. Maybe it was last episode. I can't remember for sure, but Alabama freshman Noah Clowney would fit that for me. Average 9.8 points per game, 7.9 rebounds. If you, look at if you project it out to per 40 minutes average to double double 15.4 and 12.5 uh, just shy of a block a game just shy of a steal per game uh, playing alongside Brandon Miller obviously elevated what he's able to do um, but man Noah Clowney is somebody I might look at here what do you think Raphael yes yeah Clowney's one of the guys that I'm just like I can't believe he's he's still available like for me it's like I'm thinking he's already gone (laughs) (laughs) because he's like you said, he did all that on a good team. I think that's the the main thing that you left off and you describe everything that that he does well, but you forgot he did it on a team that was arguably the best team in college basketball during the regular season. And he's someone that a year ago at this time was not considered a one and done. I don't even think he was a top 40 or 50 prospect. Well, the pick is in. Let's go to Locked On Clippers host Darian Vaziri with the 30th selection in our mock draft. Hi, I'm Darian Vaziri, host of Locked On Clippers. And for the 2023 NBA draft and the Clippers 30th pick, I am picking Brandon Pazimski from Santa Clara. And the reason why I'm picking him, I saw him ranked like 34th in a mock draft, but I'm picking him because I saw him play live last season at Pepperdine and this guy has a great feel for the game he can shoot the ball from all three levels and he does what's done most in the NBA today as far as guard and that's handling the ball and pick and roll and he does that very well he threw this one pass where I was literally at the game sitting at center court and I did not even realize who he was passing to the last second if he's seeing passes out there through traffic that I'm not even seeing on the sidelines that's a special player And I think even though he's not going to play right away, the Clippers draft him because the Clippers are a win now team. I think he's a good guy to have in the future that could develop into a good pick and roll ball handler at the NBA level. Ooh. All right. Santa Clara guard, uh, Brandon Pazinski Um, off the board. Officially you're sort of smiling and nodding your head, Isaac. Um, What do you think he adds to the Clippers? Well, I'm not a couple picks ago. So, because check out my man's hair. He's rocking the curls. He's a southpaw like yours truly. Have you ever seen us in the same place at the same time? I don't think. No, I'm just kidding. I'm a terrible three-point shooter. By the way, let me say something back to what Raphael was saying about Noah Clowney. I know he didn't come off, but yeah, he was 99th at 247 Sports coming into last mm. year. So very unheralded. Anyway, uh, yeah. I, for, I love the Brandon Pajemski pick. I think he's a phenomenal shooter. He's got like these Dante DiVincenzo vibes of like, dude, I'm a stud and I know it and get off me. Um, I, I love that energy that he brings. Really cool for Santa Clara to have players picked in the first round in back-to-back years, going back yeah. to Jalen Williams last year. And it had been like almost three decades before that, the last Santa Clara pick. Anybody got that? Steve Nash. Steve Nash back in wow. 96. Nice pull, Barlow. That's why you're the top. That's why you're the GOAT and an esteemed colleague. Anyway. <laughs> Most uh, importantly, listen, esteemed colleague. They're going to have to figure something out on the West Coast because now this means in our mock draft, the West Coast Conference has two players selected, Pac-12, goose egg for them. So anyway, back to Brandon Pajimski, man. Massive showing both at the Combine and at his Pro Day. I'm sure Rafael will talk about that. But not only is he a shooter, he was the co 
uh, player of the year in the West Coast Conference last year, leading rebounder in yeah. the conference, 8.8 rebounds per game as a 6'5 guard, third leading score at 19.9, fourth in assists, fourth in steals, fifth in threes made per game. This dude can do a lot more than just shoot. So do not um, sleep on him as always oh, a shooter and he can't do anything else. No, 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 no. Very versatile, very capable. And as Raphael said earlier, boy, Illinois missed out his freshman year where he played just 4.3 minutes per game, had like 22 total points all season. So transferred down to Santa Clara and went absolutely off. All right, let's check in with Andy Patton of Locked On College Basketball to find out his take on Pajemski. And then we'll see if, you know, anything jogs your memory when we come back. Well, every year there are guys who seem to come out of nowhere and put themselves squarely into the NBA draft process. This year, Santa Clara's Brandon Pajemski was one of the biggest standouts because he barely played at all at Illinois during his freshman year. Transfers to Santa Clara to kind of take on that Jalen Williams role as the primary scorer. He scored more points in his first game at Santa Clara than he did in his entire freshman season at Illinois. I'm Andy Patton, the host of the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. Pajemski Pajemski is a six foot five high scoring guard. He's one of the best three point shooters in the entire class. He was an elite rebounder, and that's not just because he played in the WCC. He has the ability to impact the game on the defensive side as well. Had a lot of steals at Santa Clara. This is the kind of kid who is a quick riser for a reason, and whatever team ends up with him is going to be very happy to see him produce at the NBA level. There Andy goes again, the host of the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. I mean, Isaac, I rem- what's listen, the deal? Y'all okay. got beef let's, or what? Let's let Andy off the hook, and I'll give you the transfer. It was Francisco yes. Cafaro coming from Virginia. Okay. Is that it? Adama Ball. Adama Ball, too. Yeah. As you mentioned. Yeah. Yep. Well, there you go. Can't sleep on the West Coast Conference. Now we've got more on Pajemski, this time coming from Richard Stamen of the Locked On NBA Big Board. With the last pick in the 2023 first round of the draft, I really like what the Los Angeles Clippers did drafting Brandon Podzemski out of Santa Clara. He was a top 80 recruit, pretty consensus top 100 guy out of Illinois, going to Illinois, I should say, as a freshman last year, but never got it really a chance to shine. He goes to Santa Clara and absolutely crushes it. He followed in the footsteps of Jalen Williams, although he did not transfer. He just followed in the footsteps of that production and made a living for himself. He did everything offensively at extremely advanced reads on offense at a consistent level. He did it at the NBA combine scrimmages as well. He can shoot. He can score at all three levels. He can pass. He's a complete offensive guard that can play both guard slots. The only worry that teams may have, and this may be why he falls is because he has a mediocre wingspan about one to one and a half, two inches of plus wingspan that may hold him back, but his game speaks for itself. Okay, game speaks for itself. Anything else that you guys got to add on that? That's a great exclamation yeah, point on it, honestly. All, exclamation point. It's the only way to describe it. Like I said, four guys on his team, five other guys on the opposing team, lights on, butts in the seats, referee, whistle, basketball, and Pajemski is going to be one of the better players on the floor. Well, there you have it. We'll use that as the exclamation point to the last pick in our Locked On NBA Mock Draft special. We have gone from 1 through 30. There has been no shortage of surprises, of excitement. We'll start with the winners. We'll start on the positive, okay? I'll give you guys a minute to think, but who, Isaac, would you say was the biggest winner <laughs> from the Locked On? Do, do you want a minute to think? Because let's no, maybe, we, no. we can check in with, I've heard David Locke is having some big reactions uh, about the day he had, but you you know someone off the top of your head. Who was the biggest winner in this mock draft? The San Antonio Spurs. All right, let's move on. <laughs> as soon as the lottery happened, we knew who the biggest winner was, and it didn't matter. No, uh, in, in all honesty, I think – perhaps outside of outside of our hosts and the teams, maybe the biggest winner of this whole thing is overtime elite who gets their first ever Mm. two draft picks, both of whom are in our draft top five picks, the Thompson twins and whether or not overtime elite made the Thompson twins or the Thompson twins made overtime elite. It raises their profile in a massive way and they've got to ride that wave while it's high, see who else they can get in and then continue their brand moving forward as they try to fight with college and G league ignite and the international game. 
I think it's a great point. I mean, and certainly just in general, the G League being able to put so many players high. We looked at our top five, one college player now going off the board. Um, I mean, it's a testament for the product coming out of the international game and, and out of the new G League system and these developmental teams. Raphael, who would you say was the biggest winner? The biggest winner, I don't even know where to start. I can think of quite a few off the top of my head. The San Antonio Spurs for one. <laughs> I'd even say the the yeah. French, um, as, as far as like French basketball period with Wimba Yama going number one. Um, you got Rupair. Um, you got three guys from France's developmental program in this draft just from the same generation because they do g- generations in Europe. And then it really could be four in this draft with City Sissoko. Uh, another winner would be Overtime Elite w- was a big winner. The G League was, was a winner. I mean, there's so many, but I would say it's between the Brooklyn Nets and David Locke. Well, you know what? It's funny. The Brooklyn Nets and the Utah Jazz. Thank you. <laughs> I can't name the team for one and name the GM for the other. So I got to even it out. The Nets and the Jazz. It's true. But th- then again, you know, David Locke is the founder of our network. So, you know, he's a name that automatically comes to mind just for me. And we're talking about just the locked on, you know, brand and the special. But I actually... I think that David Locke may have been the biggest winner. Locked on Jazz, the Utah Jazz, David Locke, whatever phrasing you want to use. I mean, executed trades. I think they picked up some guys with really high potential. But let's give the audience a little reminder about how David feels about how this draft went for him. (laughs) I would like to point out that I've had one of the most remarkable trade days of all time. (laughs) Put it on the spreadsheet. Regular, regular Kevin Costner there, David. I mean, when locked on NBA Big Board grades this trade, I will be the winner or grades this draft. I got three players and my 2014 trade 2024 pick back. (laughs) I mean, that's pressure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, seriously, that was pressure, but also like what was going on? What kind of Kool-Aid was being sipped? Because it did seem like David made out pretty good uh, in some of those trade scenarios. Like we were talking about a little conspiracy action going on, some kind of, some kind of politics going on back there in the war room. I don't know, man. (laughs) One other, one other winner I would mention is the Hornets who got two potential like lottery, maybe top 10 or top five, even level Mm -hmm. picks, even though they had two and 27, if Whitehead is healthy and ready to go, that, that could be a big win for Charlotte. That's another good good one. Now, before we move on to our losers, let's hear from Locked On NBA insider Howard Beck, who was also, you know, praising the Jazz and their moves for the day. Let's see what he had to say about David Locke's uh, draft day. Look, I know the Jazz front office feels like they did really well in this series of trades today. I don't entirely disagree, but let me just start with the trade that I think they definitely won. Uh, acquiring the 21st pick and Patty Mills in exchange for the 28th pick. I'm not sure why the Nets were so desperate to get off of Patty Mills' contract that they're willing to move down seven slots in the first round. But again, I'll give the Nets the benefit of the doubt. They draft well low. I'm sure they can find value at 28, uh, just as they could have at, at 21. I will just say on the Jazz side of this, I don't know the eagerness to uh, acquire Patty Mills. He looked pretty much done for uh, most of the season in Brooklyn. Maybe there's a revival coming, and he's a great guy, great locker room guy and for a young Jazz team. Certainly uh, the kind of player you'd like to have around as a leader. So I'll, I'll give them that. In the deal with Oklahoma, look, uh, credit there. I mean, how much difference is there between drafting ninth versus 12th? You move back a few slots and you – get back your pick that you owed the thunder that to me is a clear win for the jazz uh but overall i'm a little confused about their direction today okay so some praise a little bit of mixed reviews um but moving along from the jazz i want to talk about our losers um <laughs> Raphael's already are laughing. I, love <laughs> I can't wait for that. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 I don't yeah, like yeah. calling people losers. <laughs> <laughs> See, I like it because I think it makes it so much funnier uh, <laughs> rather than just saying, okay, who, I don't know. What's another phrase? I can't even think of another phrase besides the biggest loser. <laughs> the, <laughs> on my notes, I put the winners and the not so much winners. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. See, Isaac, what is this? This is everyone gets a participation no, trophy. No, no, no. I'm not bring, about that. I'll bring you the losers. You ready for my losers? Okay, all right. Isaac's ready to call people losers. Look at him. The Pac-12, zero first-round picks by 
difference. Big 10 had six, SEC had five, Big East four, Pac-12, loser, zero. The other is the Orlando Magic. They took too big a reach going for Grady Dick at six. And then what to me made what to me was just a silly, silly trade uh, a little bit later on in the lottery. And so Magic, both with their pick and their trade decisions, out on them. They're my loser. Yeah, I'm going Raphael, to Raphael, you have with, to call someone someone a loser. Sorry. And I guess it's kind of <laughs> piggybacking, but the, the Pac-12, I mean, in some mock draft, you see UCLA could have had three guys. Mm-hmm. Maybe, let's see, at one point, maybe four. Just Jalen Clark would have been healthy throughout the year. Yep. He was getting yep. first-round love. Yep. And for them to at one point have four different guys on most first-round mocks at one point in the season to end up with zero – is an L. So I would say UCLA basketball. <laughs> and maybe the, the, the Pac-12 was the biggest loser, but UCLA won getting a Dimbona back. So That's I, right. I think that was that was a big one for them. That yeah, that'll be big. Now, if you were looking at the Pac-12, who would be the next best player, or who would be the player that maybe could have snuck into the first round? I mean, is there anyone besides Jaime Hakas that you guys are looking at that could have been even in the conversation? Yeah, Amari Bailey. And Amari Bailey yeah, is Amari a guy Bailey. That, I, that I came on late to. I did not like him in high school. I thought mm-hmm. he was a, a selfish gunner. And as the season went on, I kind of warmed up on him. But then after the combine, he really showed that he can be a point guard and that he can make the right reads and that he has – I mean, he's developed and his game has grown, but he's totally different than the player that I saw in high school at Sierra Canyon. So I think that – in a real mock, in, in a real NBA draft, he could end up as a first-round pick. But he's someone, like I said, I've warmed up when I was totally off of him at the beginning of the season. Oh. Mm-hmm. Another Pac-12 player that's not UCLA we haven't talked about is Azulis Tabellis out of Arizona, mm-hmm. um, who I, I don't necessarily think is a first-round talent, but just another Pac-12 guy that, that um, is in the mix and was phenomenal last year for the Wildcats. Mo yeah, Gay was, in- was to be the guy that I would say. And that I would have ahead of uh, ahead of uh, Tubella. So I, he's the one that I think could end up being a top 40 pick. I didn't think first round, but I do think the Pac-12 is going to dominate the second round. Okay, hmm. well, there you go. Second round for Pac-12. <laughs> I guess they'll take it. I don't know. Uh, the future <laughs> like, of that conference, uh, very uncertain at this point. Okay, but while we're talking about best picks remaining, let's each identify, Isaac, who is one of the players that could be a major steal to go in the second round? Well, I don't want to steal anyone Raphael's going to say, so I'm going to stay away from that. Uh, let me go back to Noah Clowney, who we talked about as a potential for pick 30. Uh, I think he would be great. And another one that I think we mentioned previously but haven't talked about uh, recently is Marcus Sasser from Houston, who's yeah. just uh, another um, older guy like Trace Jackson Davis, been in college for a while, could have gone, uh, could have stayed in the draft last year, came back to play for Kelvin Sampson, love everything he brings, love his defensive intent, Intensity, love who he is as a floor general. Man, I, I think he would just be a great get for any franchise. Yeah, I have three. Well, Omax, Olivia Maxon's prosper I've <laughs> talked about. He's the one that I think is the, the biggest omission. City Sissoko, who I have a first round grade on play for the Ignite. It would have been cool for the Ignite to get three guys in, in the first round. Um, <laughs> actually, it, and I like this guy a lot. I'm a big fan. And I guess you could put his name in the biggest non-winners category is Traquavion Smith. I think Traquavion <laughs> would have been a first-round pick if he stayed in the draft last year. He decides to come back to school. NC State was terrible last year. They get to the NCAA tournament this year. His numbers are pretty much the same, except his assist numbers go up, but he just didn't have the same buzz and hype around him that he had last year. And then his combine wasn't great. And so I no. think that he actually lost money by going back to school, despite mm-hmm. the fact that he got better and he came back to school to win. And it's like, you got to strike while, while the oven is hot or, or whatever that the saying is. But I think that he is someone that lost money by coming back to school. NBA money, I should say. I don't know what he got in NIL. Got <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, now there you go. You got, you, you got that as a factor too. Uh, it, it's unfortunate when you see a player go back and get better, you know, and end up losing, you know, some of their draft stock. Uh, what do you think about Smith uh, from what you've seen, Isaac? Yeah, I, I love him as as a scorer. I love his like. 
I, I will handle the moment. Give me the ball, late shot clock, whatever. Uh, he struggles sometimes for me with a little bit of decision making. I loved NC State's backcourt last year. Uh, Jarkel Joyner, there's somebody else I'm not thinking of, but it was a much better year for Kevin Keats and company there in Raleigh. And uh, thankfully, man, there was he had a scary moment. He was carted off the court with uh, on a stretcher at one point, but was fine, good to go. Um, and so I think he's a guy that is going to be a volume scorer and can be and so would be definitely, I think, a steal at some point in the second round. Yeah. All right. Well, that does it, you guys. I can't believe it. We've made it to the end of our Locked On NBA Mock Draft special. It has been awesome working with you both. Uh, so glad to have you along. And a big shout out to our producer, Ross Jackson, yes, who's been Ross. doing all of the big awesome work behind the scenes to make all of this possible and to make us look good at least we hope we haven't seen the finished <laughs> product yet so maybe we shouldn't be thanking ross quite yet but uh thank you guys for being a part of this it's been a lot of fun thank you i mean I, it, it's kind of like on one hand it's like whoo well, we're finally done Whew. but it's like it's, it's over like i know you know, yeah. spend so much time talking and, and, and talking the draft and laughing and now we just have to find a way to do it again like yeah. soon that's right. Kylan, thanks for steering the ship. Raphael, thanks for being the goat and having all this great draft insight and uh, all your fun stories. Yeah, no dude, problem. you guys both have unbelievable <laughs> insight. I am so excited because I'm going to have to start listening to your podcast. Y'all know I'm busy. I have like 20 jobs, so I'm going to have to add those podcasts to my list because I don't listen to podcasts often to listen to you guys every freaking day because both of your insights were unbelievable. Those like behind the scenes stories from when you've talked to athletes, work with families, that's what makes the Locked On Network so special. Well, we appreciate all of you who are listening or watching for joining us. That does it for episode six of the Locked On NBA Mock Draft special presented by by the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And don't forget, you can find this entire special in both audio and video at the Locked On NBA and Locked On NBA Big Board podcast feeds. For one last time, for Rafael Barlow and Isaac Shade, I'm Kylan Mills. We appreciate you being with us for this entire Locked On NBA mock draft special, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.